Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this Aspen session. Occasionally, I have the privilege of uh, moderating sessions for Aspen India. Um, you get speakers who are very high profile, sometimes arrogant, <laughs> full of themselves, um, sometimes not so easy to deal with. It's very rare to get a nice guy who is also high profile. So it's great to have you here, Shomitra, and thank you for thank you for accepting to do this. Your bio data has been circulated, so everybody knows your executive summary life story. Um, I thought I'd probe a little bit in between the lines, and then uh, bring you to the books that you've written and the themes which have uh, driven you and your experiences. So, uh, and then we will open it out to the audience to interact with you because I'm sure they'll have questions. You are uh, 23 years in INSEAD. You're a Frenchman. <laughs> you speak French? Well, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but <laughs> I take it as a compliment. <laughs> but do you? I can get by with French. So, you know, when I first came to France, it was a situation where I did not even know the word bonjour. Now, you might think it's completely uneducated, ill coot, you know, to not even know the word bonjour, but that's the situation I was in, 89. Yeah. But uh, today I have made some progress and uh, I can speak some French, but I certainly would not qualify myself to be either a Frenchman or fluent in French. I hope your Spanish is better. <laughs> well, my Spanish, Spanish is, you're asking the tough questions already. I thought you were supposed to have a gradual uh, entry into this, but uh, my Spanish is better and worse. So I think I understand Spanish better because I hear a lot of it at home. My wife is from Spain, as you know. But at the same time, my spoken Spanish is really rudimentary. I would say much far worse than uh, <coughs> French. So now you're wondering, you know, how can supposedly the bright person be so bad with languages, but that's the reality. So I'm quite uh, poor with languages. And uh, that's been a problem. Is that, a, is that a problem for all IIT people? Could be. Could be the question <laughs> the side of the side of the brain, you know, that affects you. But I do think that some men in particular probably have more problems with yeah, languages. Yeah. I certainly have some. And that makes two of us. Two of us. Because uh, today, for example, I feel I'm quite limited in terms of language capabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, English is probably my best language, and Hindi is my second best language. And I speak a smattering of French and Bengali and, 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 and right. Spanish and so on. So it's, it's not the best situation in terms of language capabilities. Anyway, Spanish gives me an opening to introduce your wife. Uh, Lourdes, will you stand up so that everybody can see you? Lourdes Casanova. And uh, she is also an academic. She also teaches at INSEAD. And she's also going to be teaching at Cornell. But we'll come to Cornell in due course. Um, there's something, somebody also fairly important in his life who's here. And that's his mother who has been quoted in Times of India when, when the Cornell news came up. Mrs. Datta, why don't you stand up so that everybody sees you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So where do you grow up? Well, let's talk a minute about your youth. Well, you know, in, in a way, my, my youth has been spread across multiple cities. Okay. So my father... When he was in active uh, service, he was in the Indian Air Force, a medical doctor in the Indian Air Force. And like most military personnel, we moved every few years. So I was born in Chandigarh and then lived in Chorat, Assam for many years, for about I, maybe the six, seven years of my life. Uh, then I spent a year or two in Delhi and then I spent, I guess, the formative years of my teenage childhood between 7th and 12th class in Bangalore. And then I went on to IIT Delhi. You're a good Bengali, you never stayed in Bengal. <laughs> <laughs> you, stayed, 
But that also, I guess, probably explains why my Hindi is better than my Bengali. Right. Because all my friends uh, essentially spoke Hindi or English, and I never really had the privilege or the you know, pain of living in Bengal necessarily full time. So. Bengal, and then Bangalore to IIT Delhi. Yes. And then Berkeley. And then Berkeley. Berkeley. Yes. yes. And that was, I suppose, a chunk of a few years. Four years. So four years. I spent four years in Berkeley from eighty-five to eighty-nine. Your bio says you work for G. When was when did that all fit in? Well, G was interesting because what happened in Berkeley was I was always interested in uh, business issues. So I went for a PhD in computer science, and then the way the Berkeley system works is they give you a stipend, but then they make you pay the tuition fees out of that. So they don't actually give you a tuition fee wave automatically. So you get the money and you pay the money for the tuition. And so what happened was in the first two years I finished all the coursework and exams for the PhD in computer science. But after that I was still paying the money, you know, it was really a tuition waiver, but still I was paying the money literally every semester for my tuition. And I felt that I had to get something back in return. So I started taking courses in the business school. That's really what happened. So even though I wasn't required to take courses, I was taking courses in the business school. And that got me much more interested in the business side of technology. So I started moving from technology to business and GE was a very nice entry point in that because GE at that moment in time, they had a demand or a need for a problem to be solved in GE Capital. That was about applying technology to M&As. And so I happened to work with them over three summers, I would say three summers and that became a part of my PhD dissertation also. Okay, that's great. And then Berkeley too? Berkeley to France, and that was uh, quite unexpected. And I never went to the U.S. with the intention of ever moving to France. But then I met my wonderful wife in uh, the U.S., and she was on a Fulbright scholarship. So a Fulbright scholarship, as you all know, required to leave the country for two years. And so we had to face a very difficult decision in terms of, you know, should we live apart for two years or should we try and uh, move back here for two years? And I happened to get the job in INSEAD, and that was an institution that was good brand, but did not require French language capability. So it required English to be the spoken language. <laughs> and that essentially provided the motivation for us to move to France. In 89, we never thought we'd live in France for you know, beyond the two years, but then two became three, three became four, and you know, essentially 23 now. So It's really an unusual institution in INSEAD. Yes, I think it's been a fantastic learning base for me. Uh, the institution has grown tremendously as, you know, 23 years ago, most people in India didn't know what NCI was or is, or, you know, it was really unheard of except in the very small circles. Even globally, it was a medium-sized European leading school. And today, it has grown to become the biggest business school in the world. It's bigger than Harvard, bigger than Wharton with three campuses, a very innovative business model, and also, I think, one of the most influential business schools in the world. So I have been very fortunate to have been part of this incredible transformation story. And I think that will help me in the future. And this is a one-year MBA, right? Uh, it's a one-year MBA, and it's not even one year, it's 10 months. And you might say, well, 10 months is Which fine. is very unusual. It's very unusual if you take into consideration that the decision to launch 10-month MBA program was taken 50 years ago. So 15 back, years ago. 50 years ago. 50 five zero. Years ago. So think about five zero. 50 years ago, the dominant model was the American model, two-year MBA. So for this small school in France to come up with this radical departure from dominant model required courage. And that paid off in big time. And today, virtually any new school that launches a new MBA program does it in one year because people realize that you can't do it two years is too long. The trouble is often when you have a two-year MBA program, you're stuck into it. You can't change because the alumni have a strong resistance to it. You know, they say, I got my degree in two years, and how can you give it in one year? You're devaluing the degree. That's the usual you know, argument that is often made, but it's very hard institution to change that way. When I visited INSEAD uh, once and um, walked around the campus, a lot of Asian students. Is that is that is there a high proportion of Asian students, Indians, Chinese, or there is a very high proportion of students from all over the world, 
especially Asia. And that happens because, and that's also another interesting thing that we do at NCR today, is there's a formal rule that says that no more than 10% of the class can be of any one nationality. So think about it. So what it means is we have limits on the number of people in any one country. And this applies to the French also? Everyone. Okay. So what happens is we have the motto that says everyone is a minority. Okay. Now this changes the nature of the debate tremendously and I can talk about how it influences the classroom atmosphere but coming back to your question specifically on the number of Asians, with the opening of the Singapore campus in 2000, for the last 10 years the number of Asians has increased dramatically. Uh, today the biggest proportion of applicants come from India. So in fact if you are Indian to get into India is extremely difficult because the biggest proportion come from India at the same time the number of admitted students is limited to 10 percent of the class. And of course we have a large contingent of people from China, from Malaysia, from Singapore and other Asian countries. But what is even more striking is the graduating class every year is about 1,100, the biggest program graduating every year. And we place about 30% of the class in Asia today. So every year the school is placing about 300, 350 students in Asia for the first job after graduation, which is remarkable if you consider any other school. No other school can even come close to that. So the Asian emphasis in the school is very significant. Do you work at all with any Indian uh, university or business school or IIMs at all? I mean, you meaning INSEAD? Yes, so INSEAD has a policy or a general philosophy of having a small number of deep partnerships. So it doesn't strike too many, it's not, it's not very promiscuous in that sense. So it has a very selective strategy of you know, having deep partnerships. So we have partnerships with a Brazilian school, we have with Wharton in the US and with Tsinghua University in China. We don't have a deep partnership with any Indian school. And partly the reason is because we have a campus in Singapore. So Singapore serves as the base for serving <laughs> India and other Asian markets. And in a sense, Singapore has you know, a large group of faculty members with interest in research in India. So we have a campus more or less in Asia serving India from Singapore. Oh, but you have a partnership in China. Absolutely, because China is a much more complex market for us to enter. India is in many ways an easier market for us to enter because it is English speaking, because it is more, you know, the, the laws and the legal systems are more familiar, educational systems are more familiar. China is a much more complex market to enter, so we felt we needed a partnership with China to enter the Chinese market. We did not actually understand China well enough. Have Indian institutions approached you? Yes, there have been a number of, uh, you know, let's say, approaches with Indian institutions, and we have done programs selectively with Indian institutions like ISB and a few IAMs, and individual faculty have partnerships with different faculty members in the schools but no deep partnership in India with any specific business school. Let me, let me jump now to the books that you've written and the work that you have done. There seems to be a very strong uh, stream of technology in your, you know, uh, right up there in your mind and you've worked at about, you know, technology and can make changes. Uh, later on I see innovation as, as a big theme. Uh, how did you come to this and you can talk a little bit about uh, these areas of your work, your writings, your books. So if you recall I said that I did my PhD in computer science. So I did not go into doctoral studies with the goal of being in a business school. So had I gone to a business school I perhaps and I may have chosen maybe the same or something else. But I was in a computer science department engineer by heart and training. And I ended up in a business school like INSEAD, a little bit by accident, because it was a way to satisfy the requirement of the two-year Fulbright requirement for my wife. And also because, of course, it was a good, you know, I, I, I was already getting interested in business issues, so it was a good forum to try and explore it further. And the focus on technology is the natural starting point for me. 
So if you look at my career, I started out initially very technical in my research. The longer I stayed in a business school, the more business applied I became in terms of my research. And my writing and my books reflect that. My first book that I wrote was titled Knowledge Processing and Artificial Intelligence. It was very much focused on some of my work in that area of artificial intelligence. And the latest book that I write is called Throwing Sheep in the Boardroom. Just to give you a sense of the, you know, the, how the interests have evolved over time. But that is a natural part of the evolution. But the roots always have been in technology as applied to business. And then about 12 years ago, I started looking at technology as being applied to national governments. And that happened as a result of the association of the World Economic Forum. You know, that's where we met also you know, a number of times. And at the World Economic Forum today, I co-edit and I produce the Global Technology Competitiveness Report, which is the most important report on competitiveness and technology. And that has provided a great learning for me in looking at the same issues at a national macro level. Now, innovation enters the picture because increasingly technology enables changes, innovations of various kinds. So innovation became a natural progression of technology discussion debate at both the firm level and also the national level. So on this global technology report, uh, is there a ranking? Yes, there is a ranking. And, and where, do we, where are we in this? Well, India is uh, not doing particularly well because uh, I think in technology especially, the image of India is a high-tech provider of services. So India does extremely well in producing high-tech services, got global leaders, of course, Infosys and Wipro and others. And at the same time, the ranking looks at how technology is being used in the entire economy, not just in the ICT sector. So if you look at the entire economy, India does not do necessarily as well for reasons that we understand. For example, in the whole area of e-skills, you know, India is not very high. In the whole area of penetration of internet, India is again not very high. So you have several areas where the improvements, but typically India comes in the rank of roughly around 40s. The rank varies year to year, but 40s in a population of about 120 countries. And who is number one? Number one once again varies, but in the top 10, you usually find a mix of some Asian players, some <coughs> North American players, some European players. So European players tend to be Scandinavian countries, you know, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and so on. Mm -hmm. North American tends to be Canada and USA. And Asian players tend to be Singapore, Hong Kong. So Singapore comes up usually very high, number one, number two. I think this year it was Switzerland that came up number one. But it's a mix of these kinds of countries you see in the top. Where is China? China is interesting because a few years ago, China was below India in the rankings. And today it is above India in the rankings. So China is moving up in the rankings. And that is happening not because suddenly the Chinese IT industry has you know, done something different, but because you're seeing the results of the Chinese investments in education and, 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 and in R&D and all this technology intensive application that they are doing more of today. As we all know, in the last 12 years, the number of university graduates in China has increased by a factor of 10. I mean, it's amazing the amount of investment they're making in people inside the country. So those kinds of investments are helping China move up, I think, incrementally. So you're seeing that happen. India is slipping and China is rising. Now, these are all relative ranks. I must, I must emphasize that. So this doesn't mean that India is decreasing in absolute terms. Of course, India keeps on improving in absolute terms. But in relative terms, it is slowing down compared to the rate of progress in other countries. And technology took you into innovation naturally, and you kind of refer. Yes, what is absolutely. this index of innovation? Again, a similar kind of uh, it's an a, assessment of countries? Yes, so what happened was, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of how the indices came about. So the technology index came about because in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were a lot of stories of how technology was being used by this village in India or this you know, fishing fisherman in Africa or something. There were stories, not much data. So we said we have to start collecting data to be able to understand can technology lead to development, can technology lead to competitiveness. And today, as a result of the data collection that we've done for about 12 years, 
there's enough evidence out there to support the fact that technology creates jobs, technology creates development, and technology is good productivity, and so on. And there is no longer a debate that is happening about should technology be an area to invest, or should you invest the same money in health, sanitation, other kinds of critical things. Broadband is a very good example. All countries, including poor and rich, are investing in broadband. Now, the discussion is not there about is it an important area, can you prove it, so we have proven it. Now, in the same area of innovation, what happened was I started observing how do you measure innovation in countries. And what we saw was that innovation was being measured by factors like patents, publications, uh, number of PhDs, number of scientists, and so on. Those are the classical measures. All correct measures, but incomplete measures. Incomplete, why? Because these science and technology oriented measures are very well suited for developed economies. So it works very well, but it doesn't capture the innovation that you see happening in India or in Brazil or many emerging markets. So we felt the need to have a more broader model of innovation, a more horizontal model of innovation. And that's where we came up with this model of Global Innovation Index. And uh, the good news on that front is the World Intellectual Property Organization has now decided to adopt that. And they're co-publishing with NCR the Innovation Index from this year onwards. And is there an India Innovation <coughs> Index? Uh, I believe the CII is doing some work on innovation by <coughs> sectors inside the country. We had talked to CII about perhaps extending the work on Global Innovation Index to uh, India Innovation Index and ranking states. And I think there was some pushback on that because they didn't feel the chief ministers would be very happy to see their states ranked uh, publicly. <laughs> so I think now there's some ranking, that this assessment happening at the level of uh, sectors. So to the best of my knowledge, there is no India Innovation Index per se, but what I do know of there's a lot of work happening in assessing and measuring innovation in India. Now, measurement is key because if you don't measure, you can't really have a metric for improvements. Do the National Innovation Council of CI, uh, not CI, of India at all connect with you? Yes, they're connected with us, and in fact, uh, CI brings them in connection with us, and also Sam Petroda is also linked to some of the work we're doing, and so we have links with them, and uh, they are increasing synergies that are developing on that front. The work that you've done on technology, on innovation, this is you, this is INSEAD, this is the mix. Well, it's, it's, it work? it's me and my research team. It's your so, team. it's, uh, you know, and the, way, the way research works in a university environment is faculty are the drivers, <coughs> with, of course, supported associate researchers. And the institution of the platform. So, at INSEAD, of course, I'm very grateful for the support the institution provides, but we have a research lab called ELA. I direct that, I helped to found it. In the ELA, we have a number of researchers around the world. And then we have a small team of people who work on specific projects. There's one team working on innovation index, one team working on the technology competitiveness one, under my guidance, and also in partnership with our partners with the World Economic Forum in the technology reform, or with WIPO in the case of innovation index. So you are a chair, you're a professor, yes. and you've also been a dean, yes. which has got administrative responsibilities, right? Yeah, yeah. Or marketing, or whatever. Depends, Depends on the role you take, but yes, the there are take, admin yeah. responsibilities. Uh, how does it all work out? I mean, you have 24 hours a day, or a little more? <laughs> well, you know, you try to stretch time, of course, you know, as successfully and unsuccessfully as we all try. but. The move into administration is not a natural one for most professors. So most academics join academia because they don't want to go into management. Right. So that's the starting point. Because if you want to go into management, you better join a company. You don't join an academic institution. So like my colleagues, like most professors, when I joined INSEAD, I had no ambition or vision or desire to get into management. And what happens is for a number of different reasons, faculty members start getting into administration. Some like it, some don't. Those who don't like it, they get back into faculty roles. And those who like it, wish to explore it further. So in my case, what happened was my move into administration came in 1999, when in INSEAD there was a massive problem on the IT side. 
And we had a situation where the outsourcing vendor walked out and there was chaos in the, you know, the small uh, school. And of course, as you can imagine, if there's chaos in IT system, the whole system breaks down. And then the dean of the school did something which I did not realize then was a typical dean's trick to do. So he called me and said, well, look, you know, you're the only person in the school who understands computers. You're the only person with a degree in computer science. So please help us. You know, you can do a great job and all the other motivation talk. And I was young and foolish enough to say, okay, no, why not? Let's take it on. And uh, later on, I realized that as a dean, when you have a problem, you assign it to someone to solve it. So, you know, so he basically assigned it to him and he could say, okay, look, I've given the response to someone else. So it was a very tough assignment for three years because teaching about technology is one thing, but actually managing the shop, looking at how it impacts education, looking at how it impacts the two campus structure because those were the days when we all sitting on the Singapore campus. So the whole issue of integration, looking at these details was very good for me in one way. And I probably did a good job at that. So the school discovered that I have some talent for management. I also discovered that I had some talent management, and they convinced me to take on a bigger job. So the next position was I was dean for the executive education program, which was the main part of the school's uh, portfolio, about 70% of the school business. So that's how you start developing incrementally, and that's why it happened to me in my case. So you kept on with the research? Absolutely. So what I decided was that uh, I would keep on publishing. Maybe I would not publish as much in same quantity as if I was not doing administration, but I would not stop. So that was a very key decision I made. Um, and that was made possible partly because I had very good support at home, and that for that I would thank my wife, no question about it. But also I think because I had the infrastructure of a research center. So I had helped to create a research center in 99, so I had helped raise money for that. So I had raised money for the center. So. When I was a dean, I had the infrastructure support of a team of people around me. So there's no way I could have done the whole thing myself, you know, it's normal. But I had a team who were there, who were supported, funded, and who were working with me on key projects. And I also discovered something on, the, on my research career is it's very important to have partnerships. Partnerships with institutions that can project the research worldwide. So the partnership with the World Economic Forum, the partnership now with the World Intellectual Property Organization have been absolutely essential because <coughs> there is no way the work would have got the same visibility and the same adoption, the same impact without the benefit of these partnerships. So now I try to really have a good team around me. I try to have a good partner that can project the research and can get access to different resources. And I try to see as much as possible focus on work that can have an impact. How did you come to decide to cross the Atlantic? That was a very difficult decision in one way. Although some people might question, you know, why was it difficult? Cornell is a great name, it's a great school, you know, it's a, it's a no-brainer. But we were very well settled in France. To be very honest with you, we had no complaints. No complaints about the country, no complaints about INSEAD. Very, very well settled in, in, in the school. And uh, we had no active plans to try and move. We didn't have a reason to move. Did you get a call from a headhunter? Yes, the usual process, the search firm came. And when the search firm came, my first impression was, you know, like most search processes, they want to do a global search. And in the end, what I knew from prior experience in the past was that uh, most American schools they rapidly narrow down to an American subset of candidates. Because the pool of talent in America is very big, so there's enough good people are available. And there is a tendency of American schools to choose from one inside. It may not be a white American, but yeah. from inside the American talent pool. So I was expecting something similar to happen this time. And in fact, for the first interview, so I had four rounds of interviews. For the first interview, I even refused to go to New York. So I told them, you know, there's no point in me going to New York because I'm just the token, you know, non-American candidate. So I said, okay, we'll have the discussion by video conference. So I, I really had the, I, I didn't think this was something that would eventually materialize and they would take a bold decision. So I was very surprised and also happy when eventually at the end of the sort of four-month process, they decided to go with me. And of course, when the decision was made, 
it was, and I was getting committed into the process myself, I was discovering Cornell, and mentally also I started moving in the direction of saying, well, look, this is a great opportunity. It will not come back probably too many times in my life. And there's a great chance to have an impact, not just on Cornell as a university, but also on the broader community in which Cornell exists, and also on the broader global scope in which Cornell has relationships with different organizations in different countries. And I really think that Cornell provides a great platform for the next level of a professional development. So I was very happy where I was, but I had to push myself out of my comfort zone in order to be able to have the hope of exploring something new and discovering something new. Have you been there? I've been there a couple of times, and uh, not in the winter, but uh, close to before it. But uh, it's a wonderful campus. It's a beautiful campus, probably one of the most beautiful campuses in America. And also it's a very strong, community. It's a very caring community. Because it is not in a major big city, what you find is everyone out there has a very strong sense of belonging. And that is one of the elements which certainly helped my wife and me to make the decision to be able to make the move. Because whenever you want to move to some place, you want the support of a caring community. And I think we appreciate that. Um, no 10% rule? No 10% any nationality? No, or there, not, not yet. yet, not yet. Probably it would be uh, not legal to do so in American <laughs> context. Uh, but they have 30% foreign students in the MBA program. But clearly there's much more to be done in terms of making the school more international. And I assume that one of the reasons the president and provost chose my profile of me in this case is that they would like the school to have more global impact. So this is something that I really have done for a number of years. My profile reflects that. You know, born and brought up in Asia, studied in America, lived in Europe, worked globally, doing research also on global issues. That's very important. So my research on the technology index, the innovation index is really linked to global issues. So my mindset, because of research, because of living, because of working, is really very global. What's your next research? Well, next research is to focus more on Cornell, so, so to understand, to understand, uh, to understand the university, the community, because it's a new place. I have never lived there, I never actually worked, so it will require a lot of investments. I'm fully aware of that. So I do realize that the next year, I will probably keep my current research teams on technology competitiveness, innovation, working on, continuing in NCR, in collaboration with Cornell, but in NCR, in collaboration with Cornell. I'm starting a new book on social media analytics. So I've done a lot of work in the last two years in actually helping co-found companies that focus <coughs> on social media. Social media is a very big growing area, but how do you make sense of the structured data? So it's a very important area in which we're trying to apply some of my computer science techniques, some artificial intelligence, and understanding what are people saying about companies, about brands, about individuals and trying to see how can we make useful inference insights from that. So now we're in the process of writing a book on that. So that's my next research project in some sense, to continue what I'm doing in those two or three key areas and start and finish the new book on social media and analytics. Any time frame? We just started the book literally about two months ago. So the expectation is to finish it by December, if I'm lucky, and uh, you know, hopefully have it published by next summer. OK, great. He's all yours. <laughs> yes, gentlemen. Mike, please. Uh, front row, first row. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm General Ramesh Chopra. My technology is post-retirement. I was one of the chiefs in Tata Consultancy Services. What I want to understand from you, you have brought out that the global information technology of the global innovation, we are rather low wherever we are. How can we apply, despite what you said, how can we apply a technology to help in our business? You know, we are trying to improve our manufacturing, technology, <coughs> agriculture, and so on. You were interacting with Sam Petrona, that's one. Two, we consider ourselves, at least we feel, we're leaders in information technology in Asia. You know, we work in Japan. 
China, we're very much in Europe, and USA where you're going, we're doing pretty well. Now, we have the cutting edge of technology, but it seems that we're only body, you know, body shopping and services providers. So my second point is, what can we do with the present lot of IITs and so on? The other point is that in another decade or so, we're going to pump in 100 million odd workers into the world forum, because we are going to be leading everybody. What should we do so that we are technologically ahead Right now, we have the brain power. We have to put it. And do you have any social responsibility towards the same? You're doing so much good work for all these other guys. What about your homeland? Thank you, Chen. Okay. So there are at least five questions on this. <laughs> I don't know if I remember all five, but let me just uh, try to answer a few points out there. Um, you talked about the business model for Indian successful IT companies. And you're right in saying that a lot of the business model today largely involves around some variant, not the same, but some variant of bodies you know, in some sense. And most IT companies have invested a lot in process innovation and in looking at how we distribute work, how we do work. So there's a lot of process innovation that has happened in the software process in Indian IT companies. But Indian IT companies haven't done as well is in product innovation, creating products. So creating products typically requires much higher levels of investments, much higher levels of R&D. And why hasn't it happened? It's a good question. Partly, I believe, because enough easy business on the body shopping, you know, usual traditional model. So there's enough flow of business on that side. So it keeps you growing, keeps the analysts happy. And also, I think, because there is some aversion to taking large risks. So if you look at, for example, even the growth strategies of many Indian companies, they haven't really in the IT sector gone in for major acquisitions. There has been no major acquisitions in terms of large sizes and even growing even further. Now you can argue whether it's good to grow or not, that's a different story. But a lot of the growth has been driven by a more organic growth driven by the demand for these kinds of traditional services. Now to move to the global <coughs> stage, these technology companies will have to invest more in R&D, move more towards product innovation, and also very important is change the global management team to become more representative of what the world is around them. Because a lot of the Indian companies are still very Indian in the top management teams. That's something we all know is a major issue. It's not just an Indian issue, it's an issue for Chinese companies, issue of major nationalities. As you grow global, how do you globalize the mindset inside the management team? Now, you asked a number of other issues around in terms of you know, how can you link this to socially responsible tasks in, in, in India. And I think there's a lot more that can be done on that front, no question about it. And one of the ways in which you can do things is try to build more awareness around some of the issues. So if you look at the work that I'm doing in innovation, in collaboration with CII, we're trying to build more awareness of some of the themes of innovation happening inside the country. Trying to celebrate innovation where it's happening, trying to identify weaknesses where they are, have to be addressed, and then trying to foster dialogue among the key partners using local players as some of the key, uh, let's say, uh, you know, elements in that debate to help make change happen. So really it's part of the process of creating awareness and then creating a dialogue, a basis of dialogue with the local partners for creating impact and change. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very enlightening. Just a question about when you do your indexation, have you come across any numbers which tell you as to the total computing capacity of India as a nation versus China versus others and spare computing capacity for kids in university to play around with, just as much as, let's say, the guys at Google had, or the guys at Twitter had, or Microsoft had? Well, there are, there are metrics of uh, penetration of PCs in uh, schools. So you have metrics on that with either UNESCO and some other organizations. So you can use that, but in terms of total computing power available for <coughs> or something, we don't really have good metrics. But uh, the issue of metrics is a very complex one. You need to understand what you're measuring, why you're measuring, and does it actually lead to good results. Take the simple metric of school, computers in school. You can have a metric of computers in school, 
But does it actually mean you have better learning? Does it actually mean you have better results? It's not completely clear. How do you actually link the presence of computers with the presence of adequate skills and teachers to be able to use computers? How do you link that to the presence of pedagogical design innovation to be able to have innovative approach to learning? And how do you take the combination of that to be able to show that it results in effective learning? And the same kind of complexity of measurement can be applied to healthcare. You, know, you can have technology in doctors and hospitals, but does it actually improve uh, you know, treatment of diseases? Does it actually improve life expectancy? So the measurement around technology is a very complex issue. Unfortunately, at a global level, the measurement is, or making changes is a very complex issue driven by you know, World Bank protocol and World Bank delays and ITU protocols and delays and so on. To get any new metric put in place, it is a long process. So what we are doing in this process, what I hope is, our work is creating awareness of some of these complexities and by working with them, creating a change process that enables some of the right metrics to be created. In technology, we have seen some progress in the last years. Uh, for example, in the area of broadband, there are much more better metrics in broadband available today. Innovation, it is happening more slowly because there's much more, you know, less clarity in terms of what innovation is, should be, and how should we manage, and so on. But this is an ongoing process that we are contributing to. Yes, sir. Professor Somit, uh, we are really very proud of you. I have uh, three small questions to you. Uh, these are not the questions, these are the real curiosities to you and to Lordis as well. Uh, what's the impact of new technology on the business world? And what is its relevance? This is number one. Number two is, a poet said, you are my America, my new found land. You are my America, my new found land. By education, training, and marital relationship, you are global. How did you come to discover Lordis? As your life partner, how do you compare the choice of an Indian partner and a Spanish partner? <coughs> and the last is, under the impact of new marital laws in India, lots of Indian marriages are turning into business. Very sad to say. Sacramental value is missing. How do you find marriage between an Indian and a Spanish? Love knows no boundary. Love is global. Love is a world without borders. How it relates to business and new technology? Maybe we could just limit him to the first question. <laughs> well, this is a very profound, deep yeah. question. I have to reflect on them a little bit. Uh, on his next business. <laughs> No, but let me just comment very briefly. So first of all, thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate them very much. I can tell you that it's also an honor and a privilege for me to see all of you in the room. The fact that you take your valuable time to come and listen to this discussion is for me itself very humbling. So I really appreciate that. I would tell Varun also that the fact that he takes the time to moderate the discussion for me is very humbling, not just because he's a good friend, but I know how busy and how important he is. But on the issue of technology, I think, of course, technology impacts business in multiple ways. But the impact that I see is most important is the impact on young people. Yesterday, I gave a talk at IIT Delhi. Today, I gave a talk by video conference to Bit Pharma. <coughs> and I see it more and more with young people. Technology is letting them give wings to their dreams, to their hopes, to their aspirations. If you look at the average age at which people are creating companies, 10 years ago in America it was 36 years. Today, 10 years later, it is 27 years. And the expectation is going to keep decreasing in the future. So what is happening is younger and younger people are creating technology-enabled dreams, visions, that they can put in place just simply because technology exists, the access is much cheaper, and they can create new things. So in research after research we do, even the Middle East, 
we've done research in the Middle East, we've done research in, 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 in a number of GCC countries. For young people in GCC countries, technology is the most important thing for them because they say it can help them to achieve their dreams. So that, I think, is the biggest impact technology has on society, on eventually through business on business. Now, the issue you talked about, uh, Spanish versus Indian, I can only say I cannot compare. I don't have a comparison point. So I can only admire and be grateful for what I enjoy. And I'm only thankful to God for what I have. So, you know, the end of the day, I can assure you that in any marriage, and I'm sure, I'm sure, I hope you have a very happy and long marriage yourself, it's about two people. You know, the cultures don't matter that much. It's about common links, common trust values, and common uh, links you make. And the cultures matter only to the degree that if you have an argument, you can blame your culture due to cultural differences for that. <laughs> Otherwise, it's really about two people. And when the people can be Indians, can be Americans, can be any nationality, it doesn't really matter in my personal view. Yes, ma'am. Uh, taking off from what you just said, give us an insight into the startups you've been associated with, your learnings, particularly that. So entrepreneurship is, 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 is an area very close to my heart and my only regret out there is I did not do it earlier. So that's in a sense if I have regret I feel you know I should have done it much earlier. Now I'm doing it in a much later phase of my life. But having said this, the two important things that I feel today. The first is that if you look globally at the number of young people we have today, and the number of jobs required to satisfy the career aspirations of these young people, the reality is that there are not enough jobs being created by the large companies to satisfy the demand of these young people. So the only solution to finding jobs for the young people is if the young people create the jobs themselves. You know, I'm putting it in a very simple term, but that's the only solution on a global basis. It's not just India, it's the same in China where they're having enormous numbers of educated people unable to find jobs right now, in GCC the same, in Middle East the same, and everywhere else. So helping people create their own jobs is the essence of providing growth, productivity in any economy today in the world. How do you make that happen? Of course, it's a combination of having the right policy environment. You need to have some stable policies. You need to have some good macroeconomic climate and you have examples of situations where it works and doesn't work. But also I do believe that you need to have good role models. And this role model issue is something that I believe is extremely critical for inspiring people. Because innovation and entrepreneurship happens in two situations. Either from desperation or from inspiration. And I'd rather have it from inspiration as opposed to desperation. And the question really is, how do you inspire people? And, and I've seen so many examples, but the key element of inspiration is when others do it around you. Why did Mark Zuckerberg aim so high? Because he was trying to emulate and beat Bill Gates. Why do young CEOs who are starting companies out of IITs nowadays try and start companies? Because they're trying to do better than what Nandan Nilakani and other people did at India. So there's a whole, whole different set of motivational reasons that come into play in terms of young people being inspired to be able to create jobs, to be able to take risks. Now the whole issue in terms of taking risk enters the picture, but once you're inspired, you will take risks. You will. And I really believe that that's something that families can support. But today in India, I do believe things have changed because when I was growing up, like probably many of you when you were also at a younger stage of life, at least uh, chronologically, uh, you know, there were two or three role models that we had. So if you were blessed with good looks, you, know, you could hope to become a Bollywood star or some model somewhere. If you had some physical talents, you could perhaps hope to become a cricket star. You know, that was uh, the thing. And if you had neither, but probably you had something in your head, then you could hope to become a doctor or engineer and you could have you know, a good uh, life. But today what has happened is there's a fourth role model that has entered an Indian arena. That is of an entrepreneur. And that I think is very important because in India today we do have a 
certain element of respect for entrepreneurs coming in, much better than 20 years ago, and will probably only improve in the future. I have been, okay, so I have personally been associated with two startups. And one is in the social media space. So we do, so this is the reason I said I came to a little bit late in life. So I started this company about two years ago on social media analytics. So we do social media analytics for a number of different uh, global companies and global organizations. And my own lesson out there has been, the second company is on technology consulting. My lessons from these two companies is you need to have a good team of people. Because your ideas will keep evolving, but the team of people that you have around you is absolutely critical, absolutely vital. And of course, you can have a number of other things around it, but you need to have the courage to be able to explore. And the reason why I got into entrepreneurship in a small way was I was meeting so many entrepreneurs in my part of a profession. And I was seeing so many young people who are doing wonderful things, or not so young people doing also wonderful things. And I said, okay, if they can do it, so can I. I had the same feeling. But the difference, of course, was I could not and I did not have the courage to do it full time. And that's a big step that I haven't actually made myself. Bengali is not an entrepreneur. <laughs> so that's a good lesson also I should keep in mind probably. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Arvinda Brara, Chairman and Managing Director of Mantech Consultants. The question is that, uh, you know, U.S. has got tremendous technology. U.S. is also in the forefront of business. But despite that, it's not doing well in terms of people. There are people who do not have jobs. Uh, there are people who are very concerned about the day-to-day -day living. So I have a thought here that perhaps the combination of technology business must also go with values. Now the values, uh, some CEO is getting, you know, three, four hundred million dollars when the company is losing money is a bit of a question of values there. Also values when you give a, uh, a, get a big handout to Bank of America to stabilize, they pay it out in bonuses. So there are value systems which also have to be uh, in my opinion, tempered with the innovation, technology, and business. But I'd like your thoughts on that. You're raising a very important point, and thank you for doing so, because no one questions the importance of values. Everyone realizes values form the core of any family, of any organization, of any country at large. Now, at the same time, also what we have to understand is America is very successful even today. It's no longer as successful as it used to be perhaps 20 years ago in a global perspective, but still it is the dominant economy, the dominant military power, and it is very successful. Now, it has a number of important problems and challenges, and let me just explain why I think it's still doing well and what can be done on the inequality side. So it is still doing well because it still manages to attract some of the best minds from around the world. If you look at the global skill migration, America attracts 55% of the global skill migration. And that is something which is unbeatable even today. It remains to be seen how long they can maintain it. But in contrast, Europe attracts 5% of the global skill migration. So the amount of foreign minds who are willing to come to America and do interesting things is tremendous. So there's a huge inflow of rainfall in the country, which I think leads to a number of interesting examples of creating new companies, creating new businesses, and so on. America also leads in this building companies that grow. Many countries create small companies, but they don't necessarily nurture them to size, to big size companies. America has incredible ability to support the growth because of a large domestic economic base, plus very important good role models. Look at what Mark Zuckerberg is doing. He did not sell Facebook for 100 million and exit. This is what Israelis do. Israel is a, Israel is a highly innovative country, creating thousands of startups very successfully, but Israel or Israeli entrepreneurs usually sell early. They make a quick buck and they exit. 
And as a result, Israel hasn't succeeded in creating that large number of global companies. They have few, but they don't have as many as they could have. Now, in terms of the inequality issues and link back to the ethics and the culture and values, yes, America has created a few gross inequalities, especially in the compensation system and the distribution of income in society at large. And that is a major problem for the country. No one's denying it. At the same time, it's not an American problem alone. India has it. China has it. Every country in the world pretty much has seen growing inequality across the spectrum over the last, I would say, 10, 15 years. Now, it is also true that some sectors have seen excesses of the kind you mentioned in Bank of America. And financial services in particular have been guilty of many of the big excesses which have been very visible. And there's a growing sense of injustice amongst people about saying, well, look, you don't rescue the individual mortgage and a homeowner, but you rescue these big banks. And at the same time, the big banks give these big salaries and big bonuses. So what we are seeing today is there's a global sense of injustice that is permeating society at large, not linked alone to America or American finance corporations, I would say linked at large to many economies around the world, including, if I can say, India also, in different ways, different reasons, but a sense that fundamentally things are not necessarily equal. So what we have to do is, collectively, we have to be able to recognize it, because recognizing that is the first issue, and then we have to be able to make some determined steps, part of it driven by legislation, and part of it driven by collective norms that the society around us about how we should respond to it. So it's not an easy problem to solve, but it's a problem that we have to recognize and then try to have collective action to address it. It remains to be seen how we'll do at it because if we don't succeed, this deepening mistrust will become a bigger problem in society and become a bigger problem for governments because sort of the level of trust that we have in business, the level of trust we have in government is at a record low over history, over the last few years. So we have to find some ways to reverse that. And the burden is on leaders, leaders, collective society like yourself, and also on business schools and other academic leadership. So we have to be able to do this at every level. Academia has to change. In business schools, we have to see things differently. We have to focus much more on the issues that really matter. Companies have to do the same. Leaders have to follow by example. And I think political leaders also have to follow by example. So it's a whole systemic change, but we have to be able to do it. If not, there will be a rot that sets in the whole system. And we will, in the end, create a world that is much worse off for our children. I just want to add um, an experience, recent experience with the US. On my last two visits, I visited um, an energy research laboratory in New York, which is doing breakthrough R&D work, which will transform the energy scenario and reduce oil, you know, independence on oil for the US and eventually for the world. By the way, it's led, the entire project is led by an Indian American who spoke at Aspen India a few months ago. And if you go to Washington and you meet the Department of Energy, they have an incredible program on development of technology and it's again led by an Indian American. So, you know, they're still drawing amazing talent from, from around the world and of course especially from India. So, uh, you're next and then I'll go to the lady behind you. I'm Rakesh Tandon, uh, Managing Director of the IRCTC, that's the Railway Catering and Tourism Corporation. Uh, my question relates to, like, we need a huge infrastructure in India, something like one trillion dollar is what proposed to be invested. And uh, at the same time, the e-commerce is set to grow by leaps and bounds. It's a, it's Recent articles on like uh, the future entrepreneur 2012-13 is the e-commerce, and the hypothesis is that with the growth of e-commerce, one can reduce the burden of creating a physical infrastructure, and like and the likelihood of what kind of growth is expected of e-commerce. Your views on that? If you look at the geography of the internet, 
there is one definite trend. It is moving eastwards. So we look at the penetration today, the number of people online, of course, is highest in Asia because of numbers, China, India, Indonesia, elsewhere. But what is more interesting, you look at the penetration rates. Today in North America, Europe, penetration rate is about 78, 80%. So 80 percent of the population has access to the internet. In Asia in general, it is about 23 percent. So if you look at the population size in this area and the low penetration rates, the future is very clear. The future is one where the numbers of people are going to increase and explode dramatically online in Asia. Especially as devices like smartphones and so on become much more common especially as you have data-enabled handsets available to the masses that today use simple mobile phones. Now, will e-commerce relieve the burden of the infrastructure? I don't believe so. If you look at e-commerce in the West, it has only increased the shipment of goods. People are buying more and they have to be shipped more and there's a lot of activity happening in the physical space. If you look at the trend that is happening also globally, the trend is around what is called so low more, okay? social, local, mobile. So the whole element of how you combine e-commerce no longer just ordering you know, a product online. It is about conceptualizing your product and service in social terms. It's about conceptualizing it in and recognize the local context in which you are based and also in terms of mobility, mobile, in India. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kanupriya. I belong to the School of Inspired Leadership. We are a new business school uh, developing in India. And therefore, my question is uh, quite different it's from anyone else. Yes, and the uh, School of Inspired Leadership so is focusing a little bit on the values that you spoke about. Uh, my question really is about business schools because uh, because um, I below, I graduated from Iron Bangalore and after four years of working I joined Soil to really start a very different business school and the question I'm struggling with right now is what should Indian business schools do to raise their game in the global scenario because uh, when I study schools like INSEAD and uh, I see there's so much being done there which we can actually maybe replicate or learn from so just your insights on three strategic priorities for me as Soil. Soil, you know, is set up by an outstanding person called Anil Sachdev. Uh, he um, was in Aisha group and then he, he set up their consultancy. And this is an amazing school, so maybe sometime when you come in the future, we will take you to Soil. You'll have to make a trip to Gurgaon. I'd love to see the person. Right. Now, I think in terms of uh, priorities of the business schools, of course it depends on your starting point. But in reality, what you see is most business schools have some common elements. And if you look at arrival in the global stage, so that's a key issue. One key element is research. If faculty don't do research, it's difficult to be counted amongst the top business schools. So the research element becomes very, very important. And today, most Indian universities suffer from inadequate focus on research. Okay, that's the first point. And that's a little complex point because of long-term strategy or medium-term strategy. <clears throat> the second point really is around global impact, global connections, global linkages. India does not exist in a vacuum or in isolation. And India is linked to the world. And how can you increase this ability of people students in particular, to be able to live and operate in a multicultural world. In an India, we are, we are very fortunate to have grown up in a multicultural environment. But still, it is not the same as truly global environment. You look at the student profile of any Indian school, it's, not, it's very rare to see foreign faces, or at least a very small proportion of them will be foreign nationals. So can we do more to increase the proportion of foreign nationals in the programs? Can we do more to increase the amount of foreign cases used in the programs, not just only American cases, but a more global representation? Can we do more to get more research projects done by students in foreign countries? So you can think of different ways to look at this. 
but fundamentally having a more global presence in the program is very important. I think to succeed in the world, that's the reason why. And the third thing is exactly linked to the name of your school. It's about leadership. And not just leadership, but inspired leadership, I think, is a fantastic uh, theme linked to the point raised earlier about values. So how can you create a sense of being a leader? And leadership is not just about commanding a high salary. Leadership is about inspiring other people. Leadership is about raising the aspiration of people around you. Leadership is about doing the right thing. So how can you in fact create that kind of a socially aware person who's able to use his or her best abilities for the good of the organization, society around him or her? So I think the third element is really around leadership. And again, you can dissect it, dissect it in different ways. But for me, those are the three key things, research, the global nature, and the, and the leadership element. Gentlemen at the back, please. I'll come back to you, sir. And then to the lady at the back. I have a basic question that, why is it that India's, uh, I mean, ranking in the global innovation index is too low? Is it because of the government uh, uh, policy, like uh, it's a failure to implement uh, technology like 3G, 4G, and LT, LTE, which is basically doing wonders for, uh, across the world? And what uh, are you, what do you, uh, how do you see the scenario coming up in the near future, in the say five or ten years, relating to its rank ranking? Because the computer is getting much more smaller today, it's into tablets and smartphones. Okay. And my second question relates to the fact that the Indian students find it quite difficult to get, I mean, admission. Uh, I mean, uh, they simply want to. Don't. Get some foreign degree, and in, in mm -hmm. fact, get I mean uh, into some sort of trap. So, uh, how do you I mean, uh, how do you I mean uh, want to I mean uh, go into some sort of an, uh, I mean uh, so that uh, the Indian students can get into the right sort of curriculum and uh, get into right sort of uh, academics so that they can get uh, a sort of degree that can uh, I mean uh, fulfill their career for future. So, you asked two questions. The second question, very briefly, you need more. <coughs> career counseling and you need more involvement of mentors and role models. So ask yourself in university how many times have successful alumni come back and spoken to students <coughs> about their own career profile? How many times do you, no, not just universities, even schools. When people are in 8, 9, 10th, 11th school standards, they don't know what kind of profiles and careers available. They look at the father or mother who might be doctor engineer and say that this is the only thing possible. But the world has such a broader area of possibilities today. So the more you can open up the minds, the more you can give the role models in direct and indirect career counseling, the better it is in helping them choose. Getting admission, in my view, is a lesser problem because Indian students have a very good brand nowadays. So in general, most universities are very happy to have Indian students in the student body today. Now, in terms of uh, technologies, I don't believe that the ranking of the innovation index is going to change dramatically based on just technology adoption. Because innovation is a broad-based phenomenon. Innovation is about education. Innovation is about creating fundamental new ideas. Innovation is about commercialization. Innovation is about in, you know, knowledge adoption, knowledge diffusion. And technology will be one part of the element. But the more fundamental blocking factors, in my view, in the case of India, are human capital. We have underinvested in the human capital for many years. We have great human talent that is under leveraged, underdeveloped. And if you can develop them further and give them a better environment to develop, my own view is that we will see wonders in the country. Yeah. My name is Anupam Khanna. I'm from NASCO. So I have, uh, you've covered a lot of ground and I'm remarkable how much actually profound thoughts you've actually presented to us. I have too many questions, but I'll stick to one, the last one. There was an existential crisis in the business school community, I would say in the US, especially over the last five years. Do you think that is passed now? I mean, it's especially with the MBA programs, many of them revamped totally. The best ones took the lead, but, the, you know, Stanford revamped, the Harvard revamped. Do you think that is passed or is it just a phase that they're going through because now there are some issues about research, management research. But I would like to, rather than the general one, what about India? When you look at the sorts of questions that were asked there, and you try to ask the questions here, is it a 
possibility that the proliferation of business schools in India today is producing this generation of a nation of clocks. The reason for I'm using that word clocks is basically not the question. That is the form of business school education. Yeah. You, from your vantage point, you believe that. I'd just like to make one comment on the point of view of NASCOM, uh, which re reacts. I think it's very easy to call body shop. I'm new to NASCOM, and I've just been studying it for the last six months. I think the, if you look at what has happened in the Indian industry, IT industry, services, as you said, over the last 15 years, actually it's gone through two or three phases of transformation. It is no longer body shopping. In fact, most of them are the process innovation we talk about, which have to do with something which is quite antithetical to body shopping. And I think that has happened, and people like, talk, in fact, a lot of people have already written about it. And the word body shopping is often used by all the detractors of Indian uh, industry, people, the same people who want to uh, restrict the movement of Indian workers in Europe or the United States. So I would point to everybody here that please don't use that word carelessly. If you believe it, use it. I'm not saying you don't want it. But it has been used so many times by people who want to sort of, you know, prevent the growth of the Indian industry. It's much more than that today. It's $100 billion in revenue in 15 years. It's a miracle by any standard. And it's all due to a lot of capabilities and not just you know, just movement of unthinking labor. So let me just comment briefly on our last point and then we move to the other, other point. So I agree with you completely. I think the Indian IT industry deserves credit, not just for their own success, but also for inspiring the whole Indian economy. Yes. Let, let's, let's be very clear on that. So if the Indian IT industry had not succeeded in the 90s, many of the other success to other sectors would not have happened. Having said this, we also recognize that the many companies that are already doing wonderful things, even the large ones, like Infosys, they have investments in the banking products, so they're actually moving to products themselves. But there's much more that can be done. So that's the point. So the question is, when you have leaders, global leaders, they could do much more on that front. And often, I think many of them have taken the path of easy demand because demand exists in many cases for the existing service. Now in terms of business schools, if I interpret your question correctly, yes there has been a crisis in the last three, four years in the financial world especially and the whole associated developments. I would argue that business schools have really, I'm making a general statement, have largely underutilized the crisis. Yes, there has been a revamping of programs in Yale and Stanford and so on, but they haven't come to the core issue of what the crisis could teach us or what some of the crisis could perhaps create changes in the curriculum because of issues around leadership and ethics and so on. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that most business schools have not suffered in the crisis. Let me, let me explain that. So if you look at MBA enrollment, MBA enrollment is typically counter-cyclical. So if the economy goes down, MBA enrollment goes up. So MBA enrollment has stayed pretty strong for most schools. MBA placement has been a more challenge, but typically when people come in, they expect to put in their own effort. So MBA placement has not been as strong, especially in America. But MBA enrollment, which is the revenues coming in, has been largely stable. There has been some drops in executive programs which are more cyclical or cyclical some schools, but by and large it hasn't been a major drop like for example of 9-11. So what has happened is there hasn't been a financial crisis for business schools. I'm talking about the large ones. Now if you look at what is happening in the business school segment as a whole, the big ones are prospering, the big ones are the big few in the world. The middle are suffering, the MBA enrollment is shrinking, they are moving more into executive MBA and part-time MBA and other kinds of enrollments, other kinds of programs, and the bottom is basically struggling to stay afloat. So what you have situation is that the big schools, whether it's the Whartons or INSEADs or Harvards or, or you know, any of the schools, they haven't fundamentally changed things because of the crisis. If you ask the question, 
is the MBA graduate today coming out a different graduate who will not do the kind of mistakes that have happened because of the crisis in the past? The answer is not sure. Simply because most courses haven't got changed. Yes, most classes have had a few seminars and a few things here and there, but that's largely on the fringes. The core programs haven't changed. And I say this because I'm part of the process. What about ROI? ROI in terms of the? For students. Too. For students. So as long as they get the jobs, they are happy. If you look at the, 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 the two sectors that hire the most for the students is consulting and finance. Now, consulting has been pretty strong in hiring over the last few years. So even in the crisis, most consulting companies have been hiring. Finance has suffered, so people who want to go into finance, especially in America, have suffered. But worldwide, there have been jobs in Brazil and in China and in India and other markets, and the salaries are going up. You know, two years ago, the highest salaries for graduates in India were in Brazil, worldwide. So Brazil was offering the highest salaries. So people are very happy to go to Brazil and work with the banks in Brazil who are prospering. So, you know, people have moved their placements and they're more flexible in terms of where they work after graduation. So the ROI question is, hasn't been affected adversely. And because there has been no pressure, I think business schools have not really changed dramatically in terms of the crisis. Of course, they keep changing to differentiate themselves a little better in the curriculum, but really the change opportunity has not been exploited fully. Lady at the back. I'm currently at Yendam uh, Global Business School and I'm otherwise working at LTU in Singapore. Uh, I'm glad to see you here, sir. Uh, my question relates much to business school, which you have already responded to quite a bit. Uh, my short observation here in India has been really lack of research in uh, business schools. Uh, on the contrary, when I go around and I talk, everyone seems to be realizing that, that yes, that's what should happen. And as you already said, that Indians are very smart, and I, I have no doubt about that, that young Indian students are, are absolutely marvelous. But how do you go about really bringing about the change? I mean, what, what am I supposed to do? What can I do as a member of you know, academia that, look, research is important, and it should really get on the agenda? Do you have any suggestion for me? Well, the leadership of the schools have to set the agenda in that I, sense. There, there is awareness, but it doesn't happen. I mean, there is huge gap in conceptualization and implementation. It's a question of incentives. You know, faculty are like people. They're no different from employees in a company anywhere. So you have the right incentives, you have the right behaviors. So if you don't have the right incentives, you don't have the right behaviors. So if you really want to incentivize research, you have to provide the right contact with research. And that, once again, involves the right role models, the right kind of support in terms of teaching loads and other kinds of faculty support, the right kind of connections with companies, so you need to actually make uh, links to companies, you need to be able to have partnerships with uh, the right management journals. You know, pu publishing is also a networking business, so you need to be networked with the people in the right communities, go writing them, co-authoring with them, so it's a process that happens over time. And it's a cultural mindset that has to come into the organization. It is not easy. I'll tell you because I saw it happen myself at INSEAD. In INSEAD, I would say, was a teaching school till about 25 years ago. So the first 25 years, the school was a teaching institution. The next 25 years, it decided that if it had to be a world leader, it had to move into research. So the last 25 years, the school has put all its resources into research, research, research. And today the result is, it's in the top 10 in research worldwide and an e-metric. It's the only non-American school in the top 10. How has it happened? So what happened was, first thing was hiring faculty profiles, the research background, first thing. Second thing was starting a PhD program, because for faculty it's very important to have good young researchers around them. A PhD program is a very expensive program for school because it's a money drain. It doesn't generate revenue, so it's the investment you make in the faculty teaching productivity. Third thing is teaching loads. You have to reduce teaching loads. If you don't reduce teaching loads, you can't have high teaching loads and high productivity in research, impossible. Fourth thing is setting up the faculty evaluation process 
such that you're very clear about who gets promotion. There is no ambiguity in terms of who gets promotion, and research becomes a key criterion out there. And so on. I can give you know <laughs> metrics like these that actually school has put in place, and in 20 years, you see the transition happen. So it's very clear, it can be done. INSEAD have done this in 20 years. So there's no reason why other schools cannot do it in 20 years. We have four more hands up. Sure. So this will be the last round. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I teach in a business school, MBI, Delhi, Gurgaon. And uh, my question is, like you said that uh, India ranks about 40s in terms of innovation in that. And also, we know that uh, our expenditure on R&D for the country is about 0.8% of our GDP, which is very, very low compared to many countries uh, like some China and all have more than 2% of their GDP spent on R&D. Now the question is, uh, we have three sectors of our GDP. One is agriculture, manufacturing, and service. And if you see, most of the uh, uh, growth is happening more in service. And there's again in the few pockets of metros. If you go to the small towns, you know, last 30 years, 40 years, no change has happened. But if you come to Gurgaon, huge change you can see in the last 10 years. Now this is creating a lot of disparity, you know, like, and when you talk about, now the, my question is, what is the role, how to do now, like we have three, again, elements, one is academia, second is industry, and third is government. Who should take the lead? Is research should happen first or innovation, because innovation will happen in industry, not in academia. Academia can do only research, publications, etc. And the government can provide some kind of policy. Now that's what, I mean, we have 150 students who are doing PhD at our institute. And many of them are working on innovation uh, research programs. And when they go to industry, nobody talks to them. You know, because he said, what is our innovation? Where is this? Uh, you know, like, they are more within the transactions. Majority of the industry, I mean, few exceptions are there, definitely. Like Tata spend more than 1.25% of their turnover on research, with a lot of other industries and other firms, you spend more than 0.05% of their, you know, uh, the turnover out of the research. So these are the, my question. So, if you look at, uh, if you look at the percentage spend on R&D, India spends less than 1%, the US spends just below 3%, Scandinavian countries spend about 3.5%, Israel, the highest in the world, spends close to 5%. Now, what is interesting also is that you talk about sectors of the economy, we tend to think of innovation only in the high, tech, um, high technology sector. If you look at Israel, 20 years ago, the, one of the biggest exports was oranges, this to actually export oranges, about $25 million worth of oranges. Look at Israel today, they of course have a very flourishing high technology export sector. They also export oranges, even today. Same amount, $25 million worth of oranges. But what is interesting is, around oranges, they export about a billion dollars worth of agricultural technology about how to grow crops in desert-like environments. So what they have done over the last year is they have created technology around how do you grow oranges and crops in desert-like environments and they have packaged that into high technology agricultural services. So innovation is not just about ICT. Innovation can happen even in agriculture, even in the agricultural primary sector. So let's keep that in mind. Now in terms of who should do things, you know we have done a lot of research in this space and if you look at some common lessons. Of course, every country has its own unique mix of what makes it tick. But some common lessons are you need three elements. You need people, you need markets, and you need capital. So you need good people because people are ultimately the source of ideas. There's no question about it. You, know? uh, you look at, for example, US it attracts people from outside, around the world. Look at Israel. A lot of the innovation in Israel happened because of the immigration from Russia after the break of the Soviet fall, after the fall of Soviet Union, uh, into the country. A lot of Russian engineers who don't really have jobs, but very good talent. And of course, China and India that have good talent pools internally. So people is very critical. Markets, you need markets that can support innovation. So you need a citizen base, for example, if you want to innovate in mobile services, you need a citizen base, a consumer pool, who adopts mobile technology, who likes to experiment with new technology, new services. This is the reason why 
countries like Japan and Korea are leading in many areas of mobile gaming. For example, other mobile services. So you need a market. The market is not just only citizens, consumers, but also the government. The government through its procurement in most countries is a very important market player. The government through procurement policies can also support young entrepreneurial companies. Even in the USA, the government's policies for supporting young companies is very, very effective. You look at some country economies like Europe, it's a very fragmented market that doesn't really help an entrepreneur. So the more you can have supportive markets, it basically is better for innovation. And the last element is capital. You need venture capital. And venture capital, of course, not just money, but also money plus advice, plus networks, mentorship, and everything else. And once again, I take the example of Israel, because Israel is probably the only country outside the US with a highly successful, vibrant venture capital industry. How was it started? Started with the government, initially. Set up three or four venture funds, and then the transition made and passed in the private sector themselves. So the government plays a role, but ultimately it is the people who drive the process. And of course, the development of people is something that the government also has a very key role in. Ambassador Narin Suri. The economic center of gravity is gently shifting towards the east and the other emerging economies. But from the research you've done on technology and innovation, is this center of gravity also shifting towards the east? And I exclude Japan, because I think that's an old example. But exclude reverse engineering. Can we argue that, uh, can we, are we justified in saying that there is more technology development and innovation now in the East, in Asia, and the other emerging markets than before in a significant way? I think the metrics are already there. So you see last year, for example, China ranked second in the global production of patents. China already ranks increasingly very high on production of scientific papers. Now you can argue and say what are the impact of the papers and what are the long-term innovation impact and so on, but the creation of new ideas is increasingly happening and picking up pace in the East. Now, I think China and India will be the key drivers in this process, simply because of population, simply because of history, simply because of the context in which these economies are living and growing. But I do believe that Innovation will come from these economies and new ideas R&D will come from, the, from these economies also because the demand and need for the new idea is going to be higher from these economies. The context is such that, you know, if you are looking at, you know, China for example wants to provide affordable and high quality healthcare to all the citizens of 2020. Now if you have the goal, how can you provide that affordable, high quality healthcare using traditional models in America and Europe? Probably not. So the innovations in healthcare will probably emerge in China that will enable us to make that happen. Already innovations in India are happening in the same sector because we can't provide you know, healthcare, heart surgery and so on by the same standards as in the West. So we have to innovate in these areas and my belief is a lot of the innovations and the pace of innovation is going to pick up in the East. And that's one reason why companies in America and Europe traditionally are now focusing more and more on local indigenous innovations and of course eventually moving into the West as reverse innovation as you're describing. So, yeah, Professor Datta, being the authority of uh, technology impact of social media and social networking, do you think the recent time this Facebook and all this has become a threat to the governments like China, India and Syria and all this? Governments are just to collapse. Recently, Anna movement was also a very danger for the government. Do you think it has become a tool worse than a nuclear bomb or it can be a... Well, it, it is a threat, no question. At the same time, it's an opportunity also for the government. So let's not forget the two sides to the whole, uh, the whole equation. So yes, you can identify examples. In Arab Spring, there's a wonderful example of so many governments that have changed in part because of people mobilizing social media. At the same time, social media can also be a great tool for governments to engage with citizens, to be able to get the feedback and to be able to do interesting things with them. So I always look at this as a, you know, there's no, technology is organization neutral. And then you decide how you want to use it. Some people will use it in a positive way, some people in a negative way. The danger comes when governments and institutions resist the openness and transparency that is enabled by these technologies. 
And if you resist that, then people will, of course, push back and will create all kinds of additional pressures on you to change. And in some cases, the change can be you know, fairly dramatic for the institutions. But it's both good and bad. I don't think it's a clear picture of uh, only one way. So as an institution, if you're an organization, you have to look at this and say, how can I use this technology to do the good things that I want to do with my stakeholders, be it citizens, be it customers, be it other groups, to use it for good. You, you have the last question. Thank you, sir. So my question to you is, uh, like development, right, is driven by innovation, which, if I'm rightly recalling, Alan Greenspan goes on to call as constructive destruction. That's you know continuous innovation, which leads to you know, and that's the understanding that we have at the highest level, right? And then I'll quote something from uh, Mr. Jagdish Bhagwati, where he talks of our children at the bottom of the pyramid, where he's talking at the base, right? But we see a large gap between this you know higher level of understanding that we have and this base where we have an aversion to adoption to any innovation. So how do you see this gap being filled? Because that's the major challenge that we, you know, as a society we see. Bottom, the bottom of the pyramid was CK Pradhat. Sorry, sir. I'm, I'm wrong on recalling the name, not, but not at, least, at least, at least, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry on recalling the name because I've read that thing. So the question is, we, uh, you know, how do we connect this? The bottom, where we need to apply this whole thing, and the top, where we have all this innovation happening, and we also have a commitment, and we understand the importance, but how do we fill up this gap? Yeah. You know, let, let me just give you some numbers, which might just provide some context. I saw a piece of work that gave the number of years it took some key technologies to reach a penetration of 150 million. So the fixed line telephone took 89 years to reach a penetration of 150 million, so 150 million homes. The television set took 38 years on a worldwide basis to reach 150 million homes. The mobile phone, today we have more than 5 billion. The mobile phone, the first 150 million took 14 years. iPod took 7 years. Facebook took 5 years. Okay, now you put these numbers together, 89, 38, 14, 7, 5. You see a trend out here. So what I just wanted to make is, I'm not completely sure that people are not adopting technology faster and faster. I think the trend we are seeing right now is consumers, citizens are adopting technology at a speed which exceeds the rate at which organizations are adopting technology. And that is happening for the first time, I would say, in the last five, seven years. A very good comparison point is you think of yourself 10 years ago, what you could do in the office and what you could do at home. 10 years ago, most of us could do more in the office with technology than at home. Today, for most of us, is the reverse. And that gap is growing. So what I'm just trying to tell you is that today you will find people more ready for innovations, more ready for new ways to do things, and you'll find organizations, including companies, including governments, much less ready for the change. So the burden really today is, I would say, more on institutions to be able to change fast enough to keep in line with the changing expectations, changing models of behavior from citizens at the grassroots level. Now the element of bottom of the pyramid introduces a dimension of affordability and access, introduces an additional element, but technology is increasingly becoming cheaper and cheaper. So even the bottom of the pyramid falls in the same bucket of fast adoption more and more. So the world is where in which I think the bottom will push for the changes and the top will be struggling to keep up with the pace of change. I've been listening to you for the last uh, one hour and 35 minutes. It wasn't too painful. Yeah. Um, well, I tell you what I was, I was thinking. Was amazingly thoughtful remarks by you. Just amazing. So much depth, so much quality in, in what you say. Uh, you are so clear, uh, so articulate in the way you say it. You are so direct and straightforward. And you have so much command of the subjects, the issues, the data which you just talked about. I think Cornell is lucky to get you. And we are lucky to have you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karun. You are a good friend. And I always, you know, Karun has been a friend and mentor for me over the last years. And I hope you'll continue to be the same as I make my way to Cornell. Thank you very much. Thank you.
uh, in the room, in the corridor just behind us.